I'm going to give our audience a moment to join us. How's everyone doing today? Very well. Doing well. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Looking All forward to this. All right. Well, I know we have a lot that we want to get through today. There's a big list of questions, so I'm going to jump in. Welcome, everyone. Today, our conversation is about investing during hard times, how transformative lenders and prop techs can thrive. Now, we have really great questions and really great content for today, but I want to turn things over to Brad to introduce who our panelists are today. Brad is the head of prop tech at Tavant. And Brad, I'm going to turn things over to you to introduce our panel. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Um, we have two amazing panelists today. Uh, Mamta, I'll go with you first. Uh, an amazing career. You're now head of product at Haven. Prior to that, you've been at some of what I would call the most cutting edge or front forward facing uh, companies in the, in the fintech prop tech space. Depends how you define some of them, but they kind of huddle back and forth between the two. And so we're very excited to have you on today. Uh, Matt Wood, I've known Matt for a while. So Matt, thank you for joining us as well. Uh, you've been uh, with Tavant. You currently head up Tavant's bank tech practice, but also have been very active in the, the fintech space there and really diversifying um, how we do rapid API deployments as a company. So uh, very excited to have you both here. Allison, as always, I love seeing you and love uh, having you host and moderate things for us. So uh, let's jump right in. All right. So with that, the first question, not an easy one that I have for both of you, but I want to make sure that everybody gets to sort of pick your brains a little bit. What are some of the recommended strategies and best practices that you guys would give to our audience as far as investing is concerned? Mamta, please. Okay. Um, thank you for the kind words. Um, and thank you everybody who's attending. Um, I think during these times, I mean, the natural tendency is that, you know, this is a hard time. Uh, we need to cut our costs. We wanna, you know, stop our spend. Uh, we want to cut back. And um, I think there's there's time and there's room to do a little bit of that. But more importantly, I think it's important to remember that most you know, of the hard times are followed by great periods of growth. And so uh, a good way to look at it is to say, what are the few things that we know that are the most important that we want to invest in? And we can, you know, we'll, I'll give Matthew a chance and then, you know, Matthew, we can, we can go through some of that list, but really aligning on so what are some of the things that you need to, to really focus on. Um, and this could be different for different companies. Those are the kind of things that this is the time to get ready when the market turns for you to be prepared to take advantage of it. Right. Right. And a couple of thoughts from my side to add to that is um, one, um, I call it rationalize rationally. In other words, you know, all of us have to look at the balance sheet. All of us have to look at our top, our top and bottom line contributions, and we have to act, you know, accordingly. But what I've seen is is more of a familiar pattern. Is it is such a difficult thing to rationalize a company, uh, to do layoffs, to do the hard things like that. Um, typically, um, companies will go from being enormously optimistic, like many of my clients were in May, to totally pessimistic to right now. And nothing really much has actually changed in the real world <laughs> between, between April and today. What's changed is the understanding of the same, same circumstances. And so just rationalize rationally. In other words, apply some thinking to, to you know, what's really going to matter. And then this, my second thought kind of, you know, bumps up against mom to what you said earlier. And I just call it, can you have easy choices and hard choices? Um, uh, I would say, try to make some of the hard choices. Hard choices are where you have to choose between this thing or that thing. Uh, hard choices are what really matters to us when we come out of the recession um, or that come out of these economically challenging hard times. Another hard choice could come in the form of how do we need to take a different footing in order to compete today? Where we were successful yesterday, Will we be successful today and tomorrow? And how do we have to change operationally? Those are the types of kind of hard choices I think that every company needs to look inward and ask themselves. Um, you know, as we as we work through it at a strategy level, um, 
that's where you can kind of unfold um, the role of technology, the role of operations, the role of all the kind of the other corporate functions per se um, against your strategy. But let's let's first, you know, think clearly and and act carefully. Yeah, yeah, Matthew, that's that's great. And I think just so that you know, I think the audience gets uh, you know some of the specifics. I think as you think through that, Matthew. You know, some examples that come to mind, you know, having gone through seeing, you know, the slowdown that came with COVID, but also having experienced some of the slowdown that we saw in 2008. Um, a few things that made sense uh, then were for companies that were looking at sources of revenue coming down and a, a good strategic uh, goal was to expand your revenue sources. So yes, you know, people went to refis you know, now in this market, some of the things that you would look at is maybe look at the home equity that, that customers have and maybe an offering that helps them uh, really um, use that or, you know, a home, home equity line of credit, you know, so I think moving, you know, to that, that seems like a, a, a good area. The other areas, you know, you talked about competition, right? Mm -hmm. I think we saw that a lot of people moved, made the digital switch like, you know, really digitizing the whole customer side of things, both in property tech, but, you know, largely in the lending, um, the mortgage lending side, um, that work is still continuing, right? And so those are, those are uh, and I think a lot of people, like, because technology as a sector is so badly hit, a lot of people might take away that, you know, maybe people will slow down on the digital adoption. And that has never been the case. I think what's established uh, as, as digital only keeps growing, I think. And with uh, post COVID, we've just learned to do, to do everything, you know, from our homes, from the comforts of our, our uh, couches. And so I think that continues. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised we don't talk about pajama commerce. Um, the, I totally agree. So, you know, we changed our behaviors. We learned a whole new way to behave um, during COVID. Um, it forced many of us as companies um, to, to learn how to interact digitally with our customers. And so now we have this, these economic challenges, right? Everything that was driving the great times and the high basis points per loan revenue is just simply not there anymore. Um, so uh, you're right, digital has a, has a need to be maintained. I think the stakes are pretty clear. Um, on the front end side, maintaining digital is really maintaining your access to customers, um, maintaining your ability to have a channel to sell a different product. Um, I think I think so, you know, kind of retaining and maintaining and being mindful of your digital footprint, um, kind of as a table stakes investment, I think is kind of a clear reality. I also see from a Tavon perspective, because of, of the types of clients that we work with, uh, we're seeing that the, um, the kinds of investments that are differential investments. So kind of trying to make a change today for impact tomorrow, most of those, are automation related. Um, so driving either bottom line efficiency or driving very targeted efficiencies uh, in your sales process um, or second analytics related. But the analytic related ones tend to be with, um, with uh, clients of a certain kind of order of magnitude. Um, but across the board, uh, big, big, medium or small, um, you know, large, medium, or small um, automation is a is a cross cutting theme that we're seeing that's taking place pretty much everywhere. Yeah, I think you touched one an important thing, right? Where we talked about the automation. I think the other thing to look at is you look at your model and say where are you lacking, right? Like whether it's on the competitive side or long term. I know, of course, in the fintech world, profitability is almost like now a prerequisite. So a lot of companies are taking this time to saying. Really, how do we how do we really move towards that that goal of profitability? But there are others as well. Like you know, I think I read somewhere that 2008 Samsung, when they were coming out of the recession, made a huge investment into improving the quality of their products. And the hypothesis there was that you know when people will come back, they will want longevity in the consumer appliances goods that they were looking at. So they built this quality to come out as a leader. And that was transformational. I mean, that helped them really, really garner the market share. So I think looking at your model and saying, what are some of the things that I need to correct for when, you know, uh, when we come out? I think those are 
whether that's cost cutting, whether that's profitability, you know, not having a dependence on one channel uh, for acquiring all your customers, building. I think in our space, we work largely with servicing on the servicing side building a long-term relationship how do you really start building that on this so that you could treat each customer as a relationship and not a transaction so i think those are those are good areas to invest in so mamta i have a question for you um mm-hmm. in our prior conversations you you coined a phrase that i'm totally going to steal that you talked about you know, like growth by subtraction or growth through subtraction tell me a little bit more about that because i think it's a really cool way of looking at prioritization. Yeah, I absolutely, you know, and I think it's something that we should do every day, but during hard times, it's even more important. I mean, I would take the, you know, just take your everyday life when you're super busy, Mm -hmm. you know, I think just solving, you know, uh, that by saying I need to do more or adding more stuff Mm -hmm. doesn't always work, right? You have to kind of say, oh, I've got to like remove some of these things from my plate. But, you know, on the business side, I think it's, during this time, it's really important. There will be uncertainty. You will need the time to focus on some of these unknowns. And so for it to not distract what you're really doing is you've got to really say, this is my area of focus. So you actually bring in that focus by subtracting uh, some of it. The other corollary to that is when you look at your technology and you look at your platform and you're, you, you really have to start looking at adoption, you know, what's being used, what's a distraction, what's something that you can pause on right now. Um, you know, it's, it's things like that, that'll really help you get the most out of the investments you've already made. And then also cut some losses. Um, because I think this is a good time to really simplify what you have or what you do next. And I think that that subtraction helps me in my personal life, but also helps me immensely when I think like I one of the factors I always look at is not you know where are users really interacting with my product I also want to know where are users not interacting at all and you know I have seen there's times where we are investing 10% of my edge capacity on a product that's used by two customers and it's important to know like why is that and if it is really not important to the customers why do it right and that's such a hard thought process to go through because you, you, what you're saying is, I will have to tell a customer no. Yeah. And that's a very difficult thing. So I, I want to build on one thought um, that you sparked, sparked in me is around adoption. Because mm-hmm. when it comes down to this, this effort to focus or prioritize or taking away what we should, that we simply don't need to look at, um, adoption, I think, is a really good yardstick to measure ourselves by. Yeah. You know, so the way I see it in my mind's eye is we want to size you know, your go forward investment size with your go forward adoption curve. If those two line up, if I invest this and create these five capabilities and these five capabilities can't be adopted quickly or won't be adopted for a long time, then you're out of sync. Um, So adoption is a great way to test kind of, not only do I have a good idea, but do I have an idea that will have immediate traction? and to me, adoption's probably a better way of considering what I should and shouldn't do than even running the numbers, to be honest. Because if you know it's gonna be adopted, then you know there's value there, how much you'll, you'll work it through. But, um, so I think that's a really kind of a great, you know, in growth by subtraction, look at your adoption, the size and pace of your adoption, match up your size of investments to that, your capability, your ability to absorb and to launch. Um, I think are all real good ways of, from a framework perspective of how do you address the presence in the market today? So I wanna jump in quickly here because I wanna make sure we get to this one question before we get uh, further into this, but you guys just mentioned adoption rates and looking, really looking at what your customers are using and using that as a strategy to move forward. So the question I wanna ask both of you is, where do you think your customers want you to invest? Like how, how do you look, how would you look at that outside of adoption? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think there's a few ways to do it. And I think that, you know, you know, like it's a theory that we really adopt a lot in, in our business is, or on the product side is jobs to be done, right? Like in this market, 
what is the job that the customer is really looking for or looking to do? Um, and how can we help with that? And I think there is no substitute to talking to customers. And for, you know, it could be a business customer, or it could be a you know a end user. Uh, both are kind of important. And so I think focusing on some of those aspects, and they change. These jobs are changing. So an example I'll tell you is, as people, you know, now have bought their homes, uh, and they're looking to live in these homes, and um, they want to, you know, they've made that big financial decision. Um, one of the areas they want to, you know, make sure is, did we do everything right? And so, you know, things like, you know, do I have the right insurance coverage? Do I have the right, am I paying too much for some of this? I think some of that is, you know, the potential for saving, but also I have this home equity. Now I cannot look for a new home. I want to renovate my kitchen or, you know, what, what are some of those, what are the right projects for that, that, you know, I need to invest in. And so um, I think keeping a year out for hearing what the customers are asking, um, some of it is research, some of this is trends uh, that we know that people are invested in. I think that's going to be really important. You know, from a, from a Tavant side, we have, you know, Tavant's clients and then we have Tavant's clients customers, right? And, then, and, then, and those are the, the people that really matter in this equation in the sense that the customers that are out, you know, either buying homes or refinancing or taking out, um, you know, home equity loans or credit or loans. Um, and that's, that's who really matters. Um, but the way we've been able to kind of answer the question of like, what are we finding our, our clients would like us to invest to? Um, one, it's automation, like we talked about earlier. Two, um, we're targeting we're targeting hard problems that we had yesterday that are still here today. Um, it's like typical issue, right? Documents to data. You know, when we've been talking about it for a long while here in in, in the mortgage technology space. But you know, fundamentally, from an R and D perspective, um, you know, um, you know, our strategy has been to continually to keep chipping away at the long-standing problems. And so if you look at what's coming out of our investment portfolio, what you're seeing is you're seeing the application of automation to these long-standing issues and having really concrete, kind of tightly um, boundaried um, solutions so they can kind of have a high impact very quickly, as opposed to here, implement this giant system so you can get one benefit over there. No, it's take this component, stand it up, run with it, it'll work in concert with, your, with the landscape that you have today. But that's kind of our approach to our clients' needs in, in this time and our anticipation of what they're gonna need next year. And I think, Alison, do you, one, one more thing I'll think about is when you think of the customers, you have to like think of it like all the way till the end. So this is what the customers want. A lot of it was, we played Wizard of Oz in this industry or in, in the industries we work in, right? So we take the complexity out for customers and present it to them, but then keep the, the complexity still not fully solved, right? With We've automated on their side, but the operators are still like paddling like ducks, <laughs> right? And But that shows, that tells, right? A company that's doing that versus a company that's truly gone document to data right, will not run into the issue of, oh, I made this mistake and this was not caught and, you know, you need to re-sign your disclosures. So I think it's to, you know, what the customers want, but taking it to the logical end of what's the best way to, to provide that and not just stop there. Um, because I think operators also are customers. And if you really are trying to digitize your product, you've got to digitize your entire product. I mean, there are places where you still need the people for sure, right. but you want to make it easier for them to take the tedious tasks out of their day-to-day. -day. So what would, your, what would your advice be as far as the investments that best reposition you for strength as this cycle continues? How, what, would, what are your thoughts on that? Because I, I know we've briefly touched on that this is, that mortgage is cyclical and that you have to have your eye on long-term things instead of short, keeping in mind short-term goals. So just interested to hear what your recommendations would be as far as that, as far as keeping in mind the 
completion of the cycle as a long-term goal. I'll lead out on this one. I think kind of, okay, first and foremost, um, and this may sound obvious, but it's actually a very important organizing question is just who are you as a firm and what do you do well? Um, because that's the footing you're on. Um, and that's partly what any discretionary investment is going to go towards is maintaining that or improving that. And that'll be part of your strength, you know, as times improve, as the cycle comes to an end and moves into a new cycle. So I think that's kind of kind of the first principle. Um, a few of the other principles we've touched on in different ways, we've touched on kind of be aware of automation, be aware of competition, be aware of um, what you simply have to shed because it isn't working. Be willing to, you know, subtract what is both either distracting or siphoning off strength from other parts of your company. Um, those are all kind of like that bundle of kind of the, the, the needed steps or the actions required to be successful in operating in a hard time. But then I would say lastly, as a company, you got to decide um, what are the incremental um, steps that you will take to chip away at the hard problems for your clients, right? This is the same thing that, that we do, uh, Tavon and, and Haven does, is what, how, do we, how will you chip away at the hard problems for your clients? Um, and that becomes kind of your guiding, your compass heading in terms of where you might make some differential investment, differential um, strategy to, to set you up um, for success in the coming quarters and years. Yeah, no, I think that's a good way to put it. And I think it's different for every company, right? So when mm -hmm. I, I think about like, you know, a startup that's really small, that's looking to solve, you know, problems that a, a servicer has, I think at this time, in these hard times, you know, one of the things that we had, we had to shift to was instead of solving one problem, even though we had high confidence that we could solve that completely, you know, is to kind of say, can we solve two or three problems because every customer is gonna be different. And so we want a opportunity for our solution to work for multiple needs, right? And you know that, that's a good hedge in this, in this business. That said, the two or three that we are solving, can we go deep to solving it to the extent that it really does make a difference? You know, it's, it's not about just creating a page where we hope customers will come. It's about creating a page that you know, we are able to uh, not just introduce, but attract people, you know, test and work on adoption where you know, as they launch our system, they already have a fully well-functioning system. So I think some of those you know, really come company to company. I think outside of you know, chipping away at you know, digitization, automation, um, you know, we talked about subtraction. I think when I think of subtraction, I also put this in that category is, we have components that work well individually, but maybe don't work well as a whole, right? There's a lot of seams in our systems that are either not well developed or did not ever exist. And I think a lot of inefficiency creeps between functions uh, or different businesses if you have a multi product business. And I think that's a good place to look to because you're really losing you know, each, each of these pieces look very efficient, but overall there is still not a great system. And uh, sometimes just tightening the seams or adopting in technology that helps you tighten the seam um, will actually get you the largest return on both investments. So an example would be, yeah. You know, I was just well, no, I was, I was gonna uh, reinforce because I, I think the tightening of the seams is such a, um, an intuitive way to, to talk about how to get the most out of the technology you have, how to get the most out of the operational footprint you have. Um, you know, tighten the seams. I think that is a really way, encapsulates a lot of good thinking and good action. You were saying? Yeah, no, and I was saying that, you know, sometimes companies are thinking about this themselves, which right. is great also. Like I'll, I'll, the, the other hat that you should wear is, should I be doing this on my own? Or is there someone who's already doing this? <laughs> Um, and I think that's um, definitely from the 2007, 2008, some of the philosophy or thinking we took away sometimes was I'm, I'm really big and I need to do all of this on my own. Yeah. And um, I think that's changing. I've seen that change where people are like, okay, that's not a huge focus area for me. I'm not 
you know, I don't have a fully functional team that's going to just take care of it. Maybe this is a place where I can bring in someone else to help with that. Um, so I, I think that's the other piece is not always presume that you're going to build it. Um, and, and sometimes you have to build it if, if it is a strategic differentiation, but you have to be honest with yourself. I think not, not every time doing it yourself is, is the best strategy. So you both just mentioned tightening the seams. Um, to, to sort of build on that, or maybe even when you mentioned is this something I should be doing? Is it something I have to build? What would your recommendations be on how to tackle complex investments right now, especially with the current market that we're in? Yeah, I could start with this one. I think um, it's it's complex, I guess, <laughs> to, you know, to, to do that. Um, but I think the the way I, I think it doesn't change during hard times. I think you know complex decisions. I think the way you prioritize them, the way you execute on them, hopefully, kind of remains the same as what you've done in other times. But I think it, during this time, I think it becomes even more important to understand the overall what's the end game, and do we you know instead of just depending on the end game and the returns, is there ways for me to break up the returns on this particular piece? You know, how do we execute in a more efficient way, but also how do we hold ourselves accountable? Uh, you know, because what happens is it happens very commonly in our businesses. We invest in a technology, you build it and you forget it and you're gone. <laughs> Not, you know, I'm, you're off building another. So I think how do we keep people accountable? And I think there is, more need to, instead of getting attached to one ROI number, is to kind of say, how do I chunk up this work where each of these logically makes sense and then I have it all together? You know, that's the icing, that's the cherry on top. Okay. So I think chunking, uh, and also in this time, right? Like we said, there's the market's giving mixed signals. So I think you're gonna really watch every quarter and you should watch closely what's happening. And so if you kind of invest in something that, you know, only shows results three years later, that, that's hard. And so how do you chunk it up so that, you know, we see the results in one quarter, two quarter, three quarters. Now, if we have to do something different because market is changing, you still got something out of that investment. I, I think it's important to think about smaller, just like we on the development side, think of more agile and smaller concrete ways of delivering a uh, product. I think that's, that's gonna be important as, for technology and also like for, you know, partner like to land. Mm -hmm. And that comes back to the, you know, a willingness to, to buy versus build a willingness to take what the market has to offer. Um, because if it's, if you, when you do that, you are getting this concrete, you know, highly bounded, you know, component that has a beginning, middle and end. And you, you'll know kind of time to market, you'll know um, impact, you'll be able to measure and see it kind of in very discrete steps. Um, and it won't be kind of um, befuddled by the rest of the needs or the rest of the complexity because it'll perform in its own right. I want to circle back for a second because um, I think that's a, it's a really interesting point and not one that prior to talking to either of you, I had really considered when looking at these big tech investments, even when mm -hmm. I at housing wire when i'm looking at new pieces there's definitely moments where sometimes projects look a little overwhelming and it makes me hesitant to want to dive into certain platforms so you also mentioned uh in in your prior answers looking at what you have and the pieces of your existing tech stack do you think that that advice about smaller pieces applies to current tech stack adoption do you think that people should use that philosophy to look at what they have in place already? And if so, like what are some of the best ways you think or things to keep in mind as you look at them? Um, I, I think at this point, right, to look at your tech stack and, and make a, a decision on the entire tech stack, even if you want to make say, you know, all of it has to go, it has to still be piece by piece, right? Um, you know, even if you're building or if you're adopting a different uh, version, right? So I think in that, from that perspective, as you look at your tech stack, um, 
I mean, I think of our industry a little bit like the ship of TCS, right? A lot of people think we haven't made progress, but parts are changing, right? And we, we, we I think, have very close to a new ship. It just doesn't look like a new ship because there are still parts that remind us that we're still the old ship. And so you have to determine where you are, where is your ship, right? Do you need a new ship, really? Or is it you got, you built most of it uh, and you probably need to look at the pieces that need to go, or you, you may still like replace half the ship with a new product. But again, it'll have to be on, on a piece by piece, smaller mm -hmm. basis. Um, the question is that, how do you have that overall thinking? Because some of these technology investments are made by like sales makes their investments, you know, the upside makes their investments, capital markets making their own investments. And so, you know, how do you make sure that you have the same understanding, but also the someone who can really look at the overall picture? And I think I think I think that's a good role for a CTO in this market. Um, and there are lots of great people who've been there, seen all the systems, are totally capable of, of doing some of that. And I think it'd be, it'd be, that's the other piece during hard times. Like, I know this is a different market where job market's still hot, but still, I think there is a lot of, there's immense talent on, you know, from a personnel perspective uh, to, to help with some of these things. So I think that's another thing that I've seen companies show up during hard times is really make sure that you have a top-notch team, you know, going out to bat for you. So I think, yes, you know, you, 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 need, you need that one person or one team that can help you get some of those answers. Yeah, and that, you know, what you said draws a real sharp contrast to 2008 till today because you know, the, the talent pool and the available talent, the level of experience that's available is dramatically different um, today than it was, you know, um, way back in 2008. Um, you know, across the board, all different types of roles. I think that companies can and will make really good talent choices and retention choices in the coming months. You know, you know I think um, kind of looking from a, a business towards tech stack view and then tech, tech stack outward view, Business toward tech stack, you know, drive it through the lens of outcomes. Um, you know, what are the discrete outcomes that we need month by month, quarter by quarter? Um, you know, what do we really need in January? That, that'll help you make a clear-headed decision in October around mm -hmm. technology. So, you know, have it be outcome focused. I think from tech stack outward, uh, when you look at the technology stack itself is, um, it's okay to be inefficient um, if it drives the outcome. So like developers abhor writing the same thing twice. They say, let's wait two weeks. <laughs> and then we'll, we'll have all three of them done, right? But sometimes you have to write, the, write things twice. Sometimes you have to be willing to live with that spaghetti bowl of data environment so that you can create the analytics that'll drive conversions, you know, conversion analytics you sometimes have to make those trade-offs. And, um, but when it comes to performing in hard times, it makes total sense to be outcome-footed versus efficiency-footed. Um, and not that you're wasting money, but it's a little bit different mindset uh, in terms of, of what's gonna matter in the near term. Um, it may you may have to touch it twice, you may have to touch it four times, but if every time you touch it, you deliver incremental value in both you know January, February, March, and April, then it's well worth it. Yeah, I think the other thing, Allison, you know, like we said, like to keep it simple, not just in what you do, but also what you track, right? The outcome based is really important, right? Like I think having diluted outcomes and three things contributing to it, it is really does not ever give you the clarity you need to be able to kind of say, I double down on this investment or not, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think the other thing to track is what's most important to you. Is it most important that you're growing your customer base? Is this most important that you're uh, retaining the customers that you have? You know, is it more important for you to have a steady stream of income from the existing investors? These are very different objectives. 
or is NPS your, 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 the, the metric that you're looking for? And so I think in these markets, you determine what are some of the, the core metrics that you want to track and move and make sure that you're not only prioritizing projects that contribute to that, but you have a really good way of measuring and reporting those outcomes. I think that's going to be important to see on a week to week basis, if not, you know, maybe, maybe every month. Yeah, to, to place a bit of emphasis on this. Um, so to the audience, you know, we've, we've touched on a few things that seem kind of apparent and, you know, makes totally sense when we talk about them. But in practice, you know, when, because we, we get to encounter many different clients across the market. And in practice, typically when we speak of outcome, there's a lot of contending points of view. And those, those points of view tend to align to the functions within a company um, or to the structure of a company. Um, but really what, you know, kind of what we're saying loud and clear here today to you is go through the hard effort of deciding what actually matters. And then that becomes the outcome you, you organize around. Um, and it, it takes some, I'm much more comfortable when I go into a store if I have, if I can, you know, pick one of everything, right? <laughs> I'm like a kid and, and they say, you only can pick one. It takes me like a half an hour. So, um, but the reality is in the times that we have right now is we, we need to pick our one. We need to pick the thing that matters. I, <laughs> I love that analogy. You have to, you have to spend the time and, and, and think about the, the one thing that you really need to leave the store with. Um, so kind of a little bit of a transition here. Um, now, as we look to the future, um, in the mortgage and real estate economies post-recession, what companies outperform the others and, and why do you think that is? Yeah. Matt, uh, do you want to? I can yeah. run with it. I can, I can run, run with it. Um, you know, I think, go. Cool. So I kind of think along, sorry, I have to put my hands down. I think along kind of two lines, two, two thought processes. Um, you know, one is uh, companies that will outperform a year from now will have taken certain kinds of actions and they will have made certain kind of categorical uh, types of investments. So the kinds of actions were the things we've talked about before, just kind of the principles that guide, you know, a, a good, you know, establishing and maintaining a good, a good footing, a good strategy in, in these quarters that we're facing. So we've kind of talked about the kinds of actions already. In terms of the, the, the in kind of categorical investments, I personally, and maybe I'm a bit tilting too far forward, but I, I think it's going to kind of boil down to one or two things, fairly basic is you get really good at acquiring customers. So where when times are good, um, refi loans were falling from the sky and all you had to do is put a bucket out front and it filled up, you know, now you're, you become really good at finding and retaining um, customers. I think that's one area we're gonna see strong competitors come out from. I think another area we're gonna see is we're gonna see folks that truly start driving cost out of transactional cost down. So, you know, you look at the numbers, you know, from MBA, um, Allison and I were talking about these the other day, is the cost per loan has not gone the right direction over the past couple of years, right? So I think companies, some companies are going to come out so efficient um, that they'll not only have taken the cost per loan down, um, but down significantly by thousands of dollars, not by hundreds. And, and those companies, um, you know, we'll be able to do very interesting thing with product. They'll have more breathing room in terms of, um, you know, can they make more difficult decisions? Uh, they'll have more breathing room in terms of who to acquire, who not to acquire, um, all because they've, they've been able to solve part of the cost equation. And that's why I think automation is going to be such a strong theme over the next 18 months. Yeah, makes total sense. The way I look at it is anyone who's gone and truly sold some of the inefficiencies we have in the market mm -hmm. you know what like fixing what's broken mm -hmm. and so um you know to think about it 
one of the pieces that we talk about is cost of customer acquisition is at an all time high. That is the cost of loan production, a good 2000, you know, the numbers you hear is 2000 up. Sometimes it's cost of acquiring a customer. Mm -hmm. um, that is just unsustainable. And so how do you, you know, if there's a company or a technology or if it's a, a financial institution that helps solve for that, now, whether that is through retention, whether that's through, uh, you know, um, building a relationship with these customers, maybe that's through a partnership, I think that's going to be important. So, you know, reducing the burden of acquiring a customer, that's one inefficiency in our market. Uh, the other inefficiency is it costs too much. These transactions are really expensive. And I know in the past we've said this, but then we've seen these booms, right? We've seen, you know, refi boom and housing boom, and that still happened. But I think the strain is on. You know, I think the, the cost of a real estate transaction, including mortgage, is really high. And the, there is pressure on all sorts of fees, all sorts of costs. And not just for you as a provider to bring it down, but for you to bring it down, not just for your profitability, but to pass it on to your customer. Uh, I think that is another inefficiency in the market that you know, if someone can capitalize on that, that would be, uh, that would be good. The other piece is there's just too many players, right? Involved in every transaction. And so these models and you're seeing models, right? Where you see real estate and, and lending coming together. Uh, but I think there's more work to be done there, right? Like how do I get one person who gives me the right advice on the entire transaction? You know, what title am I using? You know, why, what is happening with, you know, when I list a home, buy a home? You know, there's just like, there's so many parts. There's, you have to, sometimes people when they're buying a home are selling a home. So the selling, the buying, the, you know, the realtors on both sides, the uh, financing of the new house, uh, the timing of, you know, which one happens first. And then you take the, like, these are the big components of the transaction, but the day-to-day, -day, you know, showing you a house, you know, moving, cleaning, all of those pieces, I think it's still very, very complex. I mean, I think people, if given a choice, uh, you know, would, would not want to move to a new house sometimes till they really have to. Uh, so I think that is, in companies are trying in many different ways to solve for that, to make that entire process easier or improve the seams where these people are talking uh, together. Uh, so I think that may be, um, you know, another inefficiency in the market. So companies who've taken this time to either really shine, you know, their offering during this time, like they have a good offering, let's mm -hmm. continue to shine it. Let's make sure that it's superlative. Nobody can touch us. I think that's important. Or anyone else who's taking care of inefficiencies and solving for them and, you know, come out a leader or a winner there. I think they will, they will stand out to customers. I, I have to agree with you. I think there's so many different pain points right now. <laughs> That's also part of the reality. And one of the interesting things, just so our, our audience gets this, before we went live during this conversation, we were talking right now about housing data and yeah. how many people are looking at their houses and are maybe, look, maybe have a little bit of buyer's remorse. And there's, there's a lot of different components that go into what could possibly contribute to that. Um, but I think there's also hope at the end of the tunnel. We're starting to see some economic data where that the days on market are maybe starting to extend a little bit. And we're seeing the, uh, I think the this was the first month where there wasn't as significant as an increase in home price. So hopefully positive lights uh, <laughs> at the end of the tunnel. But with, with that in mind, um, before we get to the end of today's conversation, I want to so sort of ask both of you for one piece of advice that's come up so far that you think is something to keep in mind in times of strength. And I know we talked about that positive cycle, but just to sort of emphasize it again, like what's one of the best strategies that you can keep in mind in a low economic time, but also in a successful uh, economic environment? I think it's 
not to lose focus, right? I think just staying focused, hard times or not hard times. I think at the end of the day, we're all writing our story on, you know, what we really truly do and all of the other things you've got to like, as you become leaders, you kind of have to take into account many different perspectives and all of that, but that should only allow you to continue and really deliver on what you're being asked to deliver. So as a head of product, like my real go-to is that, what did we build? What did we ship? You know, all of the other stuff uh, is, 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 is great. And I, I need to pay attention to all of the wins, but how do I make sure that I am not creating more distractions and coming in my own way or the way of the team by, by adding some of these complexities. So it's, it's important to sometimes just put your head down and, and, and just go after, once you know that this is your goal is to truly go after achieving those goals. Uh, there's, it, it's very easy to be distracted in this time. For sure. So, um... One, so one thing that Mamta has mentioned to me before, so I'm going to riff on it again, is just hard times doesn't make the hard problems go away. You will, all, those hard problems are always there. But now, interestingly enough, what we've talked about today is hard problems actually can anchor you to your best decisions. Um, so, you know, that focal point, um, choosing the point of action that really matters to your company and will, and will have outcome you know, in the market to your customers. Um, that is a great way to anchor strategy. Um, and when you, when you link all the, all the way back to solving a hard problem, um, especially if it's an industry entrenched hard problem and you can ship at that one, then you have some real power. Um, you know, there's some, real, there's some real value there just to be above and beyond the transaction and kind of staying in it for another day. Yeah. I mean, um, we I'm, I'm, I'm impressed that Matthew's taking notes when I'm, when I'm <laughs> We're, I think a poster, Mumta said. <laughs> <laughs> We're all going to have a couple, a couple Mumta gems. We're just going to be like, well. <laughs> Thank you. I was like, yeah, yeah. you're saying that. Yeah. No, but I, yeah, I think it's, um, it is, it is during these times that, you know, we are, it's, it's a test of, and hopefully what you do learn here, you continue, right? I think that's the other piece is that, you know, hard times definitely bring more of a focus and more of a um, need to really think through. But um, I also feel like you are much better prepared now to deal with the hard times if two years last year, you made the right decisions, right? So you can't always just say, okay, hard times are here. Now I need to change, <laughs> you know, what I do. <laughs> I think this is a continuum. And uh, hopefully if you did the right things two years, one year prior, you're much better situated to actually continue on that path and um, really see this through. And I think that's why it's important to deal with each of these decisions as thoughtfully um, because they really enable you to build on top of that. Yeah. And it can be extraordinarily unifying, um, both in kind of at a human level, person to person, colleague to colleague, and also at a company level. Um, you know, taking, taking, taking the time to, um, to pause, figure out how we're going to go forward, um, what's going to matter on the, on the far side of this you know, cycle we're in. Um, it can give a lot of focus and purpose to your company and to all your people. And so in that sense, um, there, there is an important kind of generative quality for difficult times. And, and, and really part of that kind of generative opportunity is to, is to make that incremental, incremental improvement that maybe we just didn't really have to make a year ago. Um, but given the times we're in, we're now, you know, we know it's, it's a must. Also, like with each slowdown comes, the, the opportunity is different, mm -hmm. right? Like when the last slowdown happened, I think a lot of the digitization on the front end customer side came out from that. You know, that was, that was the time of you had the blends and the roosted pie, but also everybody, you know, really thinking about how do I digitally reach to my, reach my customers, allow them to do everything they need to on, in, a, in a more digital way, signing disclosures, um, e-closings, all of those, as you think about them, came about from there. 
during this time, there's also like the technology that we have. So we know these problems. We actually have a really good idea what some of these solutions and some like most people are on the path to that, you know, documents to data is, is one piece, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the, the next about tech data predictability using, you know, using that to really determine the path of where a loan should really go. Like, should it really have a complete automated closing? Is that even possible? Uh, maybe underwriting. And so I think there's, you know, this time around, a lot of the problem challenges we had in 2008 have been, you know, some of them have been solved, but we have a clear understanding and we have the technology to correct for it as well. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it'll be very interesting to see, you know, the leap that the industry makes or the companies make um, from here, uh, because you really have to go to back in, in 2008 and say, there was a big leap that was made between those years to the 2015, um, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, that's what allowed us to take advantage of the boom that we saw. Exactly. exactly. Matt, I want to make sure we get a moment to talk about tomorrow's GDP numbers. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Before we run out of time. <laughs> Power went quickly. So okay. I well, okay. So GDP is going to come out tomorrow. Um, you know, I was in preparing for this. I was kind of combing through all the different, you know, stuff. Uh, and so I was reading on The Economist. And so this isn't my thinking, but I think it's an important, another important aspect of how do we make decisions and what should we keep our eye on? So tomorrow, we're probably going to see two things. We're probably going to see um, another, another slight contraction in GDP itself. But there is an outside chance that for the first time ever, um, a recession won't be declared. Um, because the counter evidence is, is the tight labor market and how quickly we recovered from COVID um, back to parity for pre-cycle labor and employment levels. Um, and pay is up and productivity is up. So... When you look at that, you know, for us in industry, in the lending industry, we're very, very sensitive to, to these to interest rates. We're very sensitive to macro changes that are like kind of lie away, far away from our, our sphere of control. But um, when it comes to making decisions here and now today, I think what we can do together is we can really kind of harken back to this conversation in terms of becoming fully aware and fully um, action by context. You know, what is our company? What do we do well? Um, what do we need to protect? What do we need to amplify? Where are the big problems internally, kind of within our own firms? What are the big problems in industry for our client or our customer or our customer's customer? Um, those are all aspects of context. So I think uh, kind of regardless of our GDP numbers tomorrow, whether it, uh, you know officially the NBER declares a recession or doesn't declare a recession, um, we do know that um, it is a mixed enough environment that there's room for uh, decisions that'll have impact. There's there's more than enough room to grow. Um, it, this is not just survive mentality. Um, we have room to execute our businesses and, and grow our companies. That's what I thought about GDP. <laughs> I was like, it would be easier if we did the talk tomorrow. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, we would know. <laughs> but uh, no, I think, I think that's the right way to look at it. I think it's also important to remember that the macro things are very important, but I think uh, you've got to really take away uh, what that does to, for you in your micro environments, your business, your company, the markets you serve, uh, you know, the customers you go after. And so um, it's, you know, just like you do it with your investor portfolio, right? You don't just base it on like, oh, am I investing in the stock market today because macro climate looks good versus, you know, what, what's really happening in the micro areas that you're investing in. So I think that's important uh, to keep in mind. All right. And I want to make sure that we both get a moment to sort of have final thoughts because we are <laughs> very closely at the top of the hour. So Matt, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn things over to you for a second just to give to tie a to tie a bow on today's conversation. Sure. Um, you know, for me, out of this conversation today, um, a couple of things stand out that I've 
kind of learn just by dialogue, by way of dialogue. And it's, it's one, um, be really mindful of aligning, you know, strategy to adoption. Um, I think that's a, a really strong key that, that Mamta gave us today around um, a good critical question to ask that helps us be able to cut through these hard decisions pretty cleanly. Um, I think too, um, the lean forward uh, towards your customer and the lean forward towards um, what drives cost or driving transaction cost, I think is the, is the next kind of way of very clarifying a difficult decision. Um, is it really gonna help us capture our customers? Is it really gonna help us um, drive transactional costs down? I think those would be the, the two things that I would kind of, kind of um, wanna take away. And I think that will, could really help us in the coming weeks. Mamta? Yeah. Um, I think for me, actually, the takeaway largely has been like, this dialogue has been really enjoyable, you know, as we met a couple of times to prepare for this too. So Alison, Matthew, you know, Brad, uh, help with that as well. I think it's really important to continue to have these dialogues, right? And I think, you know, during COVID, we somehow it's become a little harder, right? We're not meeting as, at so many conferences, we're not meeting, we're so insulated. I think having this, this dialogue helps and I think you can learn a lot from all each of us, right? So I think that uh, definitely has been one key takeaway. Um, I think I've always, you know, um, believed in this that a lot of people, you know, think fast moves slow. That's because, you know, there's a lot of second thoughts, like you, you came up with the decision so quickly, then you have rework and you're going back. And for me, I really think like think slow and make the right decision and then execute fast. Um, and I feel like during hard times that becomes even more important that once you're aligned strategically, that that's the right thing and you're on the right path, I think it clears you to execute fast because that's what's needed. All right, we are rapidly out of time. I know I have a whole page of what I'm going to now refer to as moptisms <laughs> to use in my to use in conversations moving forward. Um, but thank you both for joining us, Matt Mopta. Yeah. This has been a really enlightening conversation, and I want to echo what Mopta just said. Uh, it, this I, I've come from each of the conversations, even in planning this webinar with a couple more pieces of information that really help to look at big picture things. And it's, I think it is really important to keep having them, especially as we look to a more digital and remote world. But unfortunately we are out of time today. If there's anything you missed in today's webinar, please don't worry. The recording will be available on Housing Wires Knowledge Center. So you'll be able to rewatch pieces, take notes, <laughs> forward it to your friends but the on-demand version will be available for you to watch at your leisure. And once again, thank you both for joining us today. Thank you for our audience for joining us. And I'm going to give a shout out to Brad for introducing this and making this happen. And hopefully we'll see you all again soon.